In this video, I'm explaining quadratic funding. And this is basically going to be a mechanism for allocating funds, but also for raising funds. So to think about this, we are going to imagine a situation where a local community has a certain amount of funds to allocate to different projects. And what are they trying to do? They're really just trying to maximize the value of public goods to the citizens who live there. And so to do that, they want to make sure they choose the projects that are most valued by the community, but they also might want to bring in more money if possible. And that's, that's basically what we're doing. All right, so you might think of in your head a community that has like $50,000 to allocate to different projects, but just so that we can simplify the numerical examples we're gonna work through, let's just assume it's $100 that they have to allocate to different projects. And here might be a list of 12 projects that the community is considering. Now, there's two ends of a spectrum for allowing people to vote on which projects we're going to invest in. One is one person, one vote. So everyone comes in, we vote which projects to invest in, and we allocate the money proportional to the votes. So that's one way. Another way is one dollar, one vote. Now the one dollar, one vote mechanism is actually going to bring in more money to spend on these projects that benefit everyone. So there are advantages to the one dollar, one vote in the sense that it brings in more money, but there's problems with it in terms of the equitability of sort of the power that each citizen has for deciding which projects to invest in. And basically quadratic voting is gonna be a happy medium between those two. So to explain the two, I'd like to actually go through a situation with voting, how it would play out on the two ends of the spectrum. To do this, we're going to imagine a situation where there's three voters, just to keep it simple, Amy, Bob, and Cindy, and they have different preferences and different amounts of money. So Bob is going to be really rich, Cindy's not going to have much money at all, and Amy is going to be somewhere in between. They also have different preferences for how, how to allocate the funds. So Bob really cares about scholarships. Cindy really cares about public transportation, and Amy cares about two things. She cares about the domestic violence program, and she cares about the after-school program for kids. And she kind of weighs her preferences for those pretty equally. That's our scenario. So first let's imagine the one person, one vote scenario. In this case, each person gets to go in and cast a vote for their favorite thing. So obviously Bob's gonna support the scholarship, Cindy's gonna support the public transportation. Now, Amy has a bit of a dilemma because there's two things she values, but she only gets one vote, so she has to decide between the two. In this case, she's gonna choose the domestic violence home as the place to donate the money, and they all go in and cast their votes. Now, if we have $100 to allocate, there's really two ways we could handle this vote. One way would be to say, okay, we see a third of the votes are going to each of these three things, so we divide the money by three and give $33 to each cause. Now there's obviously different ways you could do this. You could decide that all of the money is gonna to go to one cause and the cause with the most votes is going to win. You could have different situations in between where the ice rink only gets funded if, we, if the amount of funding that we would allocate to it reaches a certain threshold. There's different ways of doing it, but it's equitable in terms of the power each person has to influence the money. The second situation we have here is one dollar one vote, in which case you contribute money to the pool and for every dollar you contribute, you basically put it in the jar. People can go in and put money in one of these 12 jars for these 12 causes. In this case, it matters quite a bit how much money these people have. So we know that Bob is rich, and so he's gonna donate $100 to his favorite cause. We remember that Amy cares about two of the causes, the domestic violence and the after-school program, and it's gonna be easy for her to divide her money into two. So she doesn't have as much as Bob, but she has some money, so she's gonna contribute $5 each to the causes she cares about. And then Cindy has almost no money at all, but she really really cares about public transportation, she relies on it, so she gives the one dollar she has to spare to the public transportation jar. Now one nice thing about this is that we've now raised more money to spend on public goods that benefit everybody. We've raised $111 from these three people. We add that to the total pot, so originally we had $100, now we add the 111 
Now we have $211 to contribute to these things that everyone benefits from. So that's great, but let's see how it gets allocated given the $1 one vote mechanism. All right, $1 one vote means we have 111 votes and the money will get allocated according to that. So 100 out of the 111 votes go toward the scholarship fund. That's 90% of the votes went towards the scholarship fund, mainly because Bob is really rich. So when we take the $211 that's devoted to all these causes, 90% of that goes towards Bob's favorite cause. Now, Amy contributed five votes each to the two causes she cared about. That's $5 out of $111. So 4.5% of the total pot goes toward her favorite cause. And that means each of her causes gets $9.50. Now, Cindy spent $1 for her cause, and that's 0.9% of the total votes cast with $1 one vote. So 0.9% of the $211 that we have to allocate is gonna put $109 towards Cindy's favorite cause. So she gets a little something. She contributed $1, and she gets nine extra cents contributed to her favorite cause because of the original pool of $100 but that's way disproportional to Bob's influence on where the money goes. So in this situation, we have an equitability issue, even though we did multiply the size of the pie that we put towards these public goods. So like I said before, quadratic voting is gonna be halfway between these two systems. It works a little bit like the $1 one vote scenario, except the influence that each person's money votes have on the distribution of the resources is not going to be their dollar amount divided by the total dollars donated. Instead, it's going to be the square root of their dollar amount divided by the sum of the square roots of all the dollars voted. Now that sounds really complicated, but it's not actually as complicated as it seems. All right, let's go through the same example with quadratic funding, where we have the same money being donated. So $100 from Bob, $10 total from Amy, except she's allocating those across two different causes, and $1 from Cindy. Okay, in this case, the weight of those votes is going to be the square root of their donation. So their power over how the money gets allocated is diminishing at the margin, so that by donating the 101st dollar, that doesn't actually have a huge impact on your influence over how the money gets allocated. We're still raising the same money, we'll still have a, a pot of money that's 211, which is the original $100 we had to allocate, plus the extra $111 that we raised from these three people. So we've, we've increased the size of the pie, but the power influence is not quite as inequitable as before. So Bob's $100 donation is gonna translate into 10 votes in terms of the voting weight, and that voting weight will go toward the cause he wants. That's of course why he's giving so much money. Amy's $10 she votes, that translates into the square root of 10, which is 3.16 and Cindy's $1 she's voting has a weight of one. That means the total voting weights contributed is 14.16. And so we're gonna divide up the $211 according to these numbers. Bob has a voting weight of 10, that's divided by the 14.16. So 70.6% of that $211 goes toward Bob's favorite cause. Similarly, Cindy has one vote out of a total voting weight of 14.16. So Cindy gets to influence 7.1% of the pool, even though she only contributed $1 out of the $111 contributed. So previously, Cindy only had a 0.9% influence. Now she has a 7.1% influence with that one little dollar she contributed. So we're moving toward a more equitable distribution of the power over the money. And you can see here the actual dollar allocations based on this quadratic funding mechanism. And let's compare this to the $1 one vote mechanism. And you can still see that Bob has a huge influence, but he's also donating a lot of money to these causes that are gonna benefit everyone. So quadratic voting really is a balance between one person one vote and one dollar one vote. It has this nice diminishing marginal benefit property to it, and diminishing marginal benefit is something that matches the shape of people's utility functions. So Bob giving up a dollar doesn't have that big of an influence on his utility because he has so much money anyway, 
but he's not going to contribute unless he has a say over how that money is used. So with quadratic voting, he still has a say, but lower income people, their money has a say as well. As a matter of fact, their money has a much higher per, per dollar donated say than his does. And so it's this balance between the two. Not a perfect balance, there's trade-offs here. This sort of gives us something that we can use if we want the benefits of both systems, even though we have to take on a little bit of the disadvantages of both systems as well. Now, there are problems with quadratic voting. I mean, one thing is it does require identity. If there's some way for Bob to create fake accounts, he can kind of get around this problem and have more power over the money than he would in quadratic voting. So it really does depend on us really knowing this is one person contributing all these hundred dollars rather than Bob going out and creating a hundred accounts that all look like a hundred Cindy's. Because a hundred Cindy's have a lot of influence, right? And this is another way that this can be equitable is because there are a lot more Cindy's than Bob's. So if there's something that's preferred, among the Sundays and they each contribute one dollar, that can gain weight pretty quickly given the mechanism. So it kind of gets around the tyranny of the rich because of the fact that poor people may have similar preferences to each other and they may not be able to donate very much but their donations count a lot in terms of the power of each each dollar donated. Okay, but Bribing can be an issue here, so let me go through an example. So let's say Bob notices that quadratic voting is not as advantageous to him as the $1 one vote system, and he wants to change that. Can he increase the value of his votes by giving money to people to donate to the cause? Yeah, he pretty much can. For example, if he finds somebody who wasn't voting before but says, I'll give you $2 if you contribute one of those dollars to this public good, that $1 is going to have much higher weight than one of the $100 that he gets based on this system. So Bob going from $100 to $101 that he's donating, the marginal value of that extra dollar on the scholarship fund is only 89 cents. And that's even when we have this extra $100 we started off with, he's getting, he's just not getting much, much return on his extra dollar added. So can he do something clever to increase the value of that dollar? Well, yes, if he can get a, a poor person to donate the dollar, the marginal effect of that on the cause he wants is $4.79. So he could actually benefit by giving a poor person $2, where he tells them, keep one of the dollars and donate one of the dollars. And that still translates into $4.79 for the cause he wants. He's just sort of taking advantage of their lower income status and the fact that they're not otherwise donating so that it looks like it's coming from someone poor who has more power um, per dollar in the system. Now, would people actually accept bribes like this? I mean, a lot of communities, there's sort of a taboo on accepting bribes. But in this case, it's kind of a win-win-win because he says, okay, I'm giving you $2, contribute one to this cause. This cause benefits everybody. All of these are public goods that benefit everybody. So the person he's trying to convince is going to see that, wait a second, me accepting this bribe does so much good for me and for the community and for everyone that why not? So there might be a higher chance that people accept bribes in a system like this. So this system isn't perfect. There's ways to manipulate it. It requires identity. It might increase the chances of bribery, but it also has advantages. It can raise extra money for the, the whole community, which could be really valuable, and yet it's more equitable than the $1 one vote system. All right, another cool thing about this, which is true of the $1 one vote system, and it's also true of quadratic voting, but it's not true of the one person, one voting system. And that is that we don't need a pool of money to start with. So we had a situation here where we had we started with a hundred dollar pot and we're figuring out how do we allocate the money in that pot. What if the pot of money we have to allocate to the, the public goods is zero? We don't have any money at all. You want people to donate money, but there's a drop in the bucket problem. These are public goods after all, and so nobody will donate. Well, one incentive to sort of raise the money is the incentive to sort of channel the community money towards causes you care about. So 
Um, that's another really nice thing about quadratic voting over the one person one vote system is that you can actually raise money from scratch by doing it this way. So I hope you found this helpful in terms of understanding how quadratic funding works. Um, if you're interested in this kind of thing, I also have a video on quadratic voting, which is a very related concept.